So, James, what does the toilet mean when you see it? Um, I guess, if, I know, if I'm being perfectly honest, it's sort of like, um, almost like a... I was going to say enemy, but more like a torture, really. It's sort of like, um, I've had such a... For like as long as I can remember, since even before my parents got divorced, like when I was, you know, five years old, like I've had a really difficult relationship with it, which sounds ridiculous, it's just a effing toilet. But <laughs> even in and of itself, the design of it looks slightly comical, but I, like, I sort of hate it. It's, it's sort of like, yeah, it's like a, a big wanker, or like... <laughs> Like, like a monkey on my back or something that, yeah, I, so, I'm, yeah. This is the world's oldest psychiatric institution. It used to be known as Bedlam, the place we hid those we called mad. We need some medication. Now known as the South London and Maudsley, I need to speak to it treats 50,000 patients a year. Any sign that you shit yourself? I, I don't think so. And numbers are rising. Relax. <laughs> the staff and patients open their doors Sit down. to show us what Bedlam oh. is like today. As you said, just, just keep going, stand up. Would you like me to stay here or would you like me to come back? Um, can you stay here? Is, is that all right? That's absolutely fine. It's a condition all of us experience at some point in our lives. But imagine if you woke up one day to find your anxiety had taken on a life of its own. I, I feel a bit anxious because part of my therapy at the moment is tackling opening and closing drawers and doors only once. But what my OCD wants me to do is it wants me to open the drawers and check them a certain number of magic times. Um, in my case, magic numbers are things like 1, 2, 4, 7, 11, 13, 16, 24, 33, 53, and they go on up to 1,234. So what my therapist had me do was just try to open the drawer once put my clothes inside and then close the drawer. Now my, my LCD is telling me it didn't feel right closing that drawer. So I'm, I'm going to want to open the drawer again and then when I close it, it has to sound right and it has to feel right. So to me, that didn't quite sound right. So my LCD tells me I need to open it and close it again. But now the problem is that wasn't a magic number. That was a number three, which isn't really good for me. Why? Because it doesn't feel right. And there's, it's, it's no other reason than that. It's, it's all a feeling-based thing. The three, for me, is a number that is bad. Aaron is 40, a middle manager with an oil company. He's one of 16 patients on an intensive therapy program at the hospital's national unit. It treats the most anxious people in the country do you need anything from your room or...? The top 1%. Um, yeah, the front door. Um, now, I'm not going to touch it now with these gloves, because these gloves are contaminated from being in the kitchen. But the cleaning ladies, they often tend to carry the rubbish in one hand and they'll, they'll even be using that hand to press the button to get out and then pulling the, the door open. So, like, that handle is like contaminated by the from the rubbish you know they've been handling. Excuse me. You could nip out now quickly. Uh, well, theoretically. <laughs> but then how would I get back in? So now, right now, I'm worried about I'm very aware of all these people and sort of watching where they are, where they're going. And so if suddenly someone disappeared around the corner, I'd probably be quite anxious that I'd done something to them to make them disappear. And particularly because there's a bin there, there's a rubbish bin there, there's a rubbish bin there, and there's one here, I know where they all are. So I'm worrying if I've put them in the bin. Helen is 33, 
a librarian at the British Museum. She obsesses about causing harm to strangers. This is just then, I couldn't see that guy for a minute. And I was quite scared, oh my God, he's vanished. But he's there. He's there? Yeah. Yeah. And now I'm thinking, is that the same man? And so on. You, you've been with us that whole time. So, if you said, have I done anything to that man, mm. we could tell you no. Yeah. It would help a little bit, but not, probably not absolutely no. There's no rational, it's not rational at all like that, you know. I can't just explain it away to myself. Six. Seven. Now, by going to seven, I've gone up and down twice, which is also four times, and seven and four are 11, so that's good. I would hide it from everybody I knew because I didn't want anybody to see my craziness. Why, um, why are you letting us see that? I know that if this can help at least one person know that they have a problem and, it, and they can be helped, that it's a good thing, really. The news is full of bad stories about us being attacked, about paedophiles, about people being murdered. Negative stories are put forward constantly to us, which increases our perception of danger. I never knew I was a lover Just cos I steal the things you hide this, this could happen to any one of us at any one time. We're all on a scale. Each, every single one of us could be tipped over. Still I am not from Barcelona Simon said three out of four who came to the unit would improve. Some would be completely cured. The therapy programme runs for 12 weeks. The theory is that if you can change the way a patient thinks, you can change the way they behave. James! Hello! James has been with us about two weeks now. He's got a long history of very severe obsessive compulsive disorder, um, mainly to do with um, making sure his bowels were empty, um, making them completely empty, and he'd go to extensive behaviours around toileting, wiping, cleaning, to be sure that he's not going to um, basically crap himself in public or have, a, have an accident, which would be totally embarrassing and it'd be humiliating to him. Open the door. Anna is James's therapist. Back home. James has been spending up to seven hours in the toilet. He's basically been stuck at home with his mum in a very isolated situation where he's just spent a lot of his life around that toilet. He's had extensive treatment in the past as well and nothing has really worked him a long term. Keep moving, well I thought actually what would be best to do is for you to go and get some lunch. Oh really? Yeah. Oh no. Like everyone here, James lives in a perpetual um, well, state of anxiety. I think, yeah, because I'm, I'm worried because I, because I, I part of me think I want, basically I think the underlying thing is I want to go to the toilet, and have all, and then like go, go have, like have a shower and get dressed and do all of that before the community meeting at one, which is over, like just over forty five minutes away. And I'd, I'd see is, have you guys had lunch or are you going to be having lunch soon? But I'm thinking, but then she's saying, oh no, you need to go when you have the urge. And the urge is there, but it's maybe not as strong as it should be. So, but okay, but then usually when you eat, it, it gets stronger, so maybe I should eat. Or maybe, I don't know, oh, it's hard, because I've been thinking, oh, should I go to the or not? Because I'm thinking, the part of me wants to really go before the community meeting at one. I, should, I, don't, I won't have enough time to do it. And I don't want to be sat in a community meeting, because I hate all the, all the sessions where we're just sat around in the circle. Really difficult, because I, I'm just sat there, and most of the time you're sort of passively just listening. No, I probably should go to lunch, I probably should, because I, yeah, the urge isn't that strong right now. So I should go to, I go to oh, I just focus on my thoughts, I'm just ruminating the whole time. What was that sensation? What was the sensation? Do I need to go to the toilet? You sort of have to be able to, well, at least for me, I find I know I need to be able to just say, OK, come on, you know, almost give yourself a pep talk. Like, I've got to be able to do this myself, because if I don't, I'm going to be stuck doing this forever. Well, I'll go to lunch. What a good idea, Tony. Yes, yes, probably. I'm, I, 
Yes, yeah. No, because yeah, because I won't obviously community meeting and then and then yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I, I should get. Uh, yes, I'll have some lunch. Yes, a normal person would. Well, I'll go to lunch. He kept himself very much to himself. Um, he'd play on his own for hours, absolutely hours. And you ask him what he was doing, and he'd say he was playing in his head. And. With hindsight now, I thought to myself, I wonder if that was particularly normal, whether it was a portent of things to come. Happy birthday, dear I'd, I'd end up walking around with, with, with pictures of him when he was little, um, and just looking at him and the photographs and thinking, how has this happened? How, 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 has, how has it come to this? Through it all, I, I, lost, I lost my James. I lost my little, happy, loving little boy. Just because yeah, I haven't gone into blue and, and stuff yet, um, so I'm a bit, uh, yeah, I'm a bit worried about how that will go. Should we let you get on? Is, is that all right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so far, James's therapist Anna has been coaxing him out of the toilet. But now, four weeks into treatment, she wants him to try and get out by himself. She set him a target of seven minutes, the average time most of us spend in the loo. So how long ago is that? I don't know, probably about three years ago. And what's your boyfriend's name? Les. Helen is being treated for an irrational fear that she's harmed people, specifically that she's put strangers in rubbish bins. Would you ask him to check things like bins and... Yeah, yeah. That just built up and built up until um, he got sort of fed up with it, completely fed up with it, and, yeah, took me home to my mum. Do you love him? Yeah, I do, yeah. Still do. We were together for about eight years. Various times he sort of tried to prove to me that you can't fit people in bins, for example, by standing in bins in the middle of a um, supermarket car park himself. Um, yeah. Sort of screaming and railing. And <laughs> Since the breakup, Helen has lived as a virtual recluse. She hasn't left the house or been to work for two years. Today she's doing a practical experiment, confronting her fear head on. She's heading to a busy part of London where she'll be surrounded by strangers. I'm actually going to walk down the street, just kind of walk, and I want you to kind of wander in and out. No stopping, no, no pausing, just kind of continuous. What's your prediction? What do you think might happen? That I'll see people that I'm worried about and I want to check. So you are going to feel anxious? And if you're not, we're not doing the right thing, right? OK. How was that? All right, quite bad. I'm worried about a man and a woman that went into a Disney store. Yeah? What, what do you think you could have done? Put the man in a bin and his wife will be missing him. It'll be terrible. It's almost like a physical urge. When I'm walking down and people are going past, speeding past, I feel like every now and again I catch somebody and it's like a physical urge to, <clears throat> at least to, to turn around and so you look. get them kind of in the corner of your kind yeah, of vision. Yeah, and it's really hard to just... At some point, that person will have insight to say, I know this is stupid, but... I know I'm not going to do anything, but at the time it feels like it. 
So there's a difference that uh, the feeling is not a fact, is what they have to learn. That they, it feels real and it feels dangerous, but actually it's not. And they feel responsible and it feels that the fact is real, but it's not. And, we and that's what we do in the behaviour experiments in testing that out. Let's find out if that is the case. How are you getting on, James? Um, well, I've had well, more than the amount of a lot of time for going to the loo. <laughs> I'm just trying to remember all the things that are sort of helpful, the things that Anna would say, or and just the sort of phrases like, you know, take the risk, you know, and, you know... James's all fear things that, is that know, he might shit himself know, in public. Like, well, you know, if you do shit yourself, you know, it's not the end of the world, you know, because it's, you know, it's a safe environment, so especially... I'm just trying to He's been in the toilet the next for almost an hour. ...and just get into the shower. But, it, but it's hard because you sort of, you keep thinking, oh, oh, but, but then after I'm in the shower, I'm going to get dressed. And then after I'm getting dressed, I'm going to be outside and around and all this stuff happens then and blah, blah, blah. His whole life since he was about 16, 17 has been completely ruined by it. And that's the only way I can describe it. It has. He hasn't had a life. It's like somebody being in prison. The first person to be arrested as part of the investigation, which is following up 400 lines of inquiry. All these times that he's ever gone in anywhere, it's it's been absolutely heart wrenching to to take him and to leave him somewhere and walk away, and especially an actual you know mental hospital. James lives with his mum on an isolated farm in the Cotswolds, run by his grandparents. As a teenager, she watched him go in and out of various psychiatric institutions. Each time he came out. James would feel better until his OCD took hold once more. I guess I just need to ask one question. Last year, his condition became so severe, he had to drop out of university, where he just started a drama degree. It's not what? It's not. It won't get any marks. Well, then you have to do a little bit more work to that one essay. No, I don't understand. Why do I need to do more work if I want to do year one again? Well, you're stupid, that's why, because they want you to do year two. That's up to you. You're going to end up not even going back to university. Why? Just, why? Well, because I'm sick of this. You'll be a student till you're fucking 30. Christ, James, I've been out. Do you know what I've been out early? My living is back up. For fuck's sake, mummy, you really do it. I really... Just send what you've got and let them fail you. Ah, why? 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 He really, really wants to get on with his life. And I really, really hope that, that this helps, but it, I know that because he's relapsed before, that it would be completely unrealistic of me to think this is the cure of, to end all cures and he'll be all right, because OCD never goes away. He's got to learn to manage it. I just now I feel like it, it's been with me long enough and because uh, if I don't get, get on top of it now, then well, that's it really. I'm just gonna be sort of uh, stuck with the OCD and not being able to do anything. And I, I really don't want to be a sort of a waste of a human. Helen has been making good progress. At 
a car that's been abandoned outside the hospital has set off another anxiety. That somehow, she's caused a road accident. All morning I've been worried, and I dreamt about driving, worried if it was real and not a dream, that I've been out somehow, taken, stolen a car somewhere and driven it. And now there's an abandoned car out there. So it's like, it must have been me. I think it must be dumped and so it's true, I must have driven in. Oh my God. When a patient starts to obsess, the therapists are trained not to give reassurance. It risks turning something completely irrational into something real. It must have been me. It must have. Yeah. Is there another explanation for it? Mm. Nothing else? Mm. It looks like it's been dumped. Well, you may have done it. I'm not saying you didn't. But what's the likelihood? Quite likely. Is that really? Yeah, seriously. And you've gone out without knowing about it, despite having sell tape across your door. Well, I had dreams about driving. But we all have dreams. I don't know if it was a dream, it must have been real. Maybe it is, but we're never going to know. So you're going to take a risk. Might be true. The weeks up until now have been doing well. So, and then maybe it's just evening and out. I don't know. But yeah, not so good. Helen's condition, like many patients here, is driven by a less well-known aspect of OCD. Just put it, just it in. Called intrusive thoughts. So who's this? This is our OCD bully, and it symbolises what people here are trying to fight every day. Often they think of people like it's like a devil, the OCD inside them. The question mark on its head is there for the intrusive thoughts that people have. The mobile phone for often gaining reassurance from people. I mean words. One of the important ones is paedophile, written right around here, because that's, that's a really common intrusive thought people have about the fact that they, they think, oh my God, am I a paedophile if I have a thought like that? And so that's a common intrusive thought people have. Most people have intrusive thoughts. I get one quite regularly. On the way to work, I pass this little school, and um, sometimes there's a nice zebra crossing and there's a lollipop lady there, and these little girls come out, and they're all holding hands, and they're dressed in school uniforms. And if I'm at the front in my car, I have this intrusive thought sometimes just to put my foot down and ram them all because they all look so nice on the side that you just have this intrusive thought, go on, just ram them and, you know, run them down. It doesn't mean anything and I, I don't worry about that at all. It's a normal intrusive thought to have. But if somebody thinks, oh my God, does that mean I'm some sort of child killer? Am I likely to do that? They may start going a different way or really worried about it. If I act on that thought, it gives credence to the thought has validity and has some sort of meaning. So with intrusive thoughts, once you get one that gives you anxiety, if you act on that anxiety and do anything about it, it's more likely to carry on. I just, I get intrusive thoughts and, and it's sort of, you know, thinking, oh, maybe you could do that. Or like suggesting like, you know, you're in your house and then, <laughs> like the thought, of incest might pop into your head for some reason, and um, and, and you think, well, why the hell is that there? I, I, you know, I don't want to do anything like that. And you, then you try and get rid of it because you feel, why is it there? Because you think, shit, I'm I'm a freak, I'm abnormal. Why would I have this? Well, no one else has these thoughts. You don't talk about that. You sometimes get these thoughts for no reason, and then you you just you start thinking of trying a ways to try and deal with anxiety. That was the most distressing aspect of all of this. When he was in the room with us, we were triggering all these thoughts off. And that, you can't even put into words how that made me feel. And Hannah, it was just terrible. James has never spoken to anyone about this, other than his mum and sister, Hannah. His unwanted thoughts feed off each other, escalating from incest to James's worst fear, that he could become the thing he despises most. What I've done is I've printed off just some articles. I've got one on, well, I've got the Wikipedia on Joseph Fritzl. Right. Um, a picture, Gary Glitter, uh, an article about sort of Jimmy Savile and Gary Glitter. But also we've got um, a picture in this one of Joseph Fritzl. 
Like the toilet obsession, the therapy continues to be about confronting the fear. Avoiding it makes it grow stronger. James, just, just talking about them, what's that brought up for you? I don't know that if I, that I could be like them if I don't ritualise or try and control my thoughts in some way, I might be like them or have the thought, oh, they're nice people, or I or something like that, I don't know. Okay. Um, so just even thinking about them is making you feel... Well, I've been ritualising every time I see the picture. It's sort of like I'm always being infected by like some sort of, I don't know, black tarry sludge or something sort coming of, into me. Um, a cemental, like the, the, the sort of the chant I have, like, I'm not a sexist, like a rapist, like a pedophile, ancestral necrophilia. So like, I feel like if, if I just give, give one inch or one millimetre of, of anything, then that would be the start of like a slope, well, I'll be fall off a precipice, and I would, that would lead, lead to me becoming a pedo. Or wanting to be one or something like that. deal with seeing any family pictures or anything else because of the intrusive thoughts. So I put all the pictures in here. And if he ever came in here, let me use this for an example. He'd pick that picture up and he'd look at it and he'd cover it up. And then he'd look at it again and he'd cover it up and try and cover it with something. And then he'd look at it again and cover it up. And that could go on for, well, 20 minutes, half an hour, even longer. this Jimmy Savile thing's not been brilliant and I'd got to the point in the end where I wouldn't have the news on because nine times out of ten there would be something about that and then it would trigger it all off again. Though it seems absolutely incredible to anybody else outside, he absolutely genuinely believes that that is what's going to happen. No matter how ludicrous it is, we know that OCD always goes to the most disturbing place and if it's not to do with um, the thing he's worried about at the moment with children, it'll get worse and worse and worse. It always will try and go to the lowest common denominator. That's how our thoughts work. Particularly things like worries about being a paedophile, that's everywhere at the moment. Everybody's concerned that, you know, everybody's cut, all these um, people that we respected are suddenly becoming paedophiles. So we kind of worry if we have thoughts, any, even anywhere near that, that we must be bad to have the thought about it. In the 80s, when I started this work, people were worried about, have I caught HIV? You know, any, they would be suddenly worried about anything that was red. Oh my God, is that tomato sauce or blood? Am I going to get HIV and intrusive thoughts there? And nowadays, there is the kind of uh, media obsession with paedophilia and rooting out and finding it so, uh, much more rife than it is. And so it's quite natural that it's around, that those are the concerns that people have. open the window let's uh, curtains a little bit um or is that tricky can we can but um shouldn't, i shouldn't be getting like this once you get into your glove mode <laughs> you can see here i've got my clean gloves set out leon is a vegan i'll just take off this pair which actually already a bit icky over time his beliefs have spiraled out of control and what are you using that this disinfectant down there? What, what, how often are you using that and for what? Don't tell the therapist this. <laughs> You're saying, have you been using that disinfectant? It isn't my main thing. I don't use disinfectant that much. He's obsessed by the idea of being contaminated 
by anything that's Lots. dead, even an insect. Is that about a, a week's worth or less? Oh, this is only about a day's worth. At 55, he was older than most patients. Dump this in the recycling bin. And didn't seem as desperate to change. To get rid of these. Your um, hands are so translucent now, it's difficult to tell whether you've got gloves on or off. I can tell. <laughs> You know, this Shakespeare thing where he said madness creeps in little by little. It does. <laughs> James was still a young man. Halfway through his 12 week course, his anxiety seemed to be improving. Over the last week, he'd been getting out of the toilet in less than 15 minutes. But with the unit closing for Christmas, it was time to return home to his mum. How are you feeling about going back for a couple of weeks? Quite anxious, actually. I, I guess because it's Christmas as well, like, you're supposed to, everything's supposed to be fine and good and happy and wonderful, and, and I feel like there's, there's a little bit of pressure thinking, because I, I so wanted, by the time it got to this stage, I'd be like, if not better, but like, in a good enough thing that my mum could really notice, and like, I wouldn't fuck up Christmas. Not that I ever had, but like last year, uh, I got up, and I was like, oh, shit, I was in the toilet and I didn't have my Christmas dinner until like after three o'clock because I was in the bathroom up until then. So uh, I hope that won't happen this year. We'd arranged to visit James back at home over Christmas. The morning we arrived, he was stuck in the toilet. Things hadn't been going well. Jamie, James, how are you doing? Do you want me to come and give you a shout in five minutes? Okay. And do you think you might be ready then? Okay, I'll give you a shout in five minutes then. Wednesday night, there was a film on the television about um, Alfred Hitchcock, Call the Girl. Um, he's a, a big fan of Alfred Hitchcock and his films. And he watched it, and he just went into meltdown afterwards. Because um, I'm, I didn't see it, but Hannah said, what a horrible man. And it was um, about his relationship with Tippi Hedren. And James just, he just freaked completely. He was, he's saying he had to get away. He, he, was, he was a horrible person, meaning James was a horrible person. He might be like Alfred Hitchcock. He was horrible, he was awful. Um, and. I ended up having to lock all the doors and hide all the keys. The film portrayed Hitchcock as a sexual predator. Watching it had triggered James's intrusive thoughts. I was getting angry, frustrated, shouting, screaming at my sister, telling her I wanted to die for fuck's sake. I don't know, I wanted to die. I mean, I, I just, I feel, um, just get out of my head with my mum and sister I'm having interest so the rest of the family I've been seeing I just I just feel so guilty for having these intrusive thoughts and I really wish I wasn't having them and in the end I managed to persuade him to to get into bed and he got into bed because he was fully clothed still and I thought if he goes gets into bed maybe he'll go to sleep and calm down and he did and when Hannah and I knew he was asleep then we went to bed but we both sat up on the landing for ages How are you doing, Jamie? OK, do you want me to give you another shout? Right. So you don't want me to come and, and give you another call in five minutes? Well, he says that's not helping, so... He's been in there for nearly an hour now. When you're doing all this treatment and everything else, and I guess this is what Anna's told him, is that the, the last thing that actually goes, or you let go, is the actual intrusive thoughts and the anxiety about it. He said, you've got to go through everything else to get to that. Well, now that makes sense. So if that's the point he's at now, this is why all this has happened. And if that's the last thing he's got to let go, then hopefully in the next six weeks or whatever, that will also go, and then, then hopefully he should be able to move on.
After a major relapse at Christmas, James has returned to the anxiety unit. He has just four weeks of treatment left. He can't seem to beat the OCD bully that's controlling his anxiety. So just imagine for a moment the bully, the self-critic of yours, is over there. You know what, James? Um, you, you, you know, you need me um, because if it wasn't for me, you know, firstly, um, I mean, God knows, you know, what horrible, evil things you would have done. And second, um, you know, that's, you know, you probably would have shit yourself long ago. And you know, third, you know, if, if it wasn't for, the, you know, the things I do, you, you know, you'd be deluding yourself, thinking that you were good at anything, that people liked you, that um, that um, you had any friends, because you know you don't. Uh, you know, everyone hates you really, um, and that that really, you know, you're a worthless human being, really, aren't you? I mean, let's face it. You know, um, skinny, scrawny, um, and just um, pretty degraded. You know. Piece of dirt. So, um, if it wasn't for me, um, you know, you'd be in a really shit position. I don't have a sense there's lots more information we can give you. It's actually about you now taking what you've learnt and doing, 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 and practicing, 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 repeating, repeating, repeating. It's not us being sort of mean or harsh, it's about saying, let's kind of switch gear now, so it really becomes something that you're, you're kind of, um, you've absorbed everything and you're applying it. Uh -huh. Are you scared? I'm scared. I'm scared for him. I'm scared for what the future might hold. Because if, if this fails for any reason, where else do we turn? Helen's time at the unit has come to an end. So no chance of a net and a over extension? I'm really sorry, it's not. No. I think, no, today I realise it's time to go anyway. So. Yes, well, I think it is time. Yeah. You've had the longest extension of anyone I've ever worked with. Haven't I haven't really. Yeah. I had a so, good one in there. Right, you got it, you got it in. <laughs> Pushed it as far as I can go. If we kind of reflect on the first day here. Yeah, that's the thing to remember, yeah. How long had it been before you left home? Two years. <laughs> Two years? Yeah, yeah. Not leaving the house. It's about you kind of having that confidence because it's kind of really up to you now. Um, I really don't want to go. Give me a hug. The thing is, she's taught me what I should do and what I shouldn't do. That's it, you know, it's just up, entirely up to me now to, to implement what I've learnt and not be doing, I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing still, but... Somehow I can't sort of get over the last hurdle of it. Yeah. James has reached a critical point in his treatment. Anna is going to challenge his fears around the toilet in the most extreme way. So just, just keep giving me feedback on on what's happening, James? He's now, he's like taking it a stage further than us. He's yeah. sort of sitting on the toilet and strain. Strain a bit, yeah. To really try and kind of um, recapture that, um, well, those sensations, but also that really sort of uh, risky, I suppose, feeling for him that, you know, he's making it even more likely he's going to shit himself. Um, and then what he's going to do is just get up and leave the toilet. So kind of really sort of pushing things as far as he, as he can, really. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Keep going, James. There's a, there's a, a fair bit of poo, but I haven't wiped and is that okay? That's just what we agreed, so keep going, James. Have you got your trousers up yet? Yes. Okay, you ready to come out? Not really, but yes. Go for it. Park. 
Okay, should we go and try and sit down? Oh. James, you've done absolutely brilliantly. Have a seat. Oh. Well done. I can't wipe until I actually go to the toilet properly again. Yeah, absolutely. This, hopefully, will actually be something that kind of stays with you because it was quite a difficult experiment. Yes. Yeah. What is perhaps really important is you leave from here now and you write down yes. exactly what you've learned. Thank you, Anna. We'd been told the key to making people better here was when they finally got insight. When they saw their greatest fear was just a fear and not a reality. It felt like maybe James had got to that point. Um, okay, don't. Don't forget, don't forget. Nope. Called, uh... Okay, today I did experiments. I was on the loo, moving, sat in one position, one position, gone, strained, no wiping, just got out straight away and been around, knowing that there was probably almost 100% of the probably is feces on, on my ass, but that's... The world didn't end as soon as I sat down for the first time, because I felt like it was going to, and remember that, I remember that, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. Um, and it's okay. Whew. When James came to the Bethlehem Royal four months ago, he told us this was his last chance to get better. Today, he's finally ready to leave. I, I, would, I would like to say um, thank you to, to, to each and every one of you. When I had my assessment, I, 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 I was thinking back in mind I probably wouldn't be allowed to come here. And even when I got here, I didn't think I would probably end up making that much progress. And Though, yes, I mean, it's about me doing it on my own and that's, that's all that, but, but I don't, I, I, I wouldn't have been able to do, I wouldn't be, yeah, to do what I've done or um, basically be able to, yeah, have a, have a, have a life now and, and I've sort of now, I'm able, well, I have the, the chance to do um, what I, I want in my life and I, the OCD hopefully won't stand in the way and that's, that's, that's down to all of you. You basically transformed my life for the better, and, and for that, I, I think I will I will always be eternally grateful, and sort of till the day I die. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right. Certainly, the best I've ever been since I've had OCD. I'm I'm sort of getting there. I am, I guess, fully discovering myself, and not taking into account the OCD. The OCD isn't colouring who I am or my behaviours or anything. It's I am becoming the person who I am. This is almost like a, a good, like I've been for a nightmare for God knows how long and now I'm entering sort of like a, a good dream. Uh, but it's, but that's all it is, it's a dream and it might be taken away from me. So I just still want to let that happen, yeah. Is it a hard game? Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For those we'd met at the hospital, it wasn't so much about finding an absolute cure. It was about learning to deal with the anxiety and then staying on top of it. Although Helen was still struggling with her thoughts, she'd actually made it back to work. After two years of being stuck at home, she 
she still hopes she can get back together with her boyfriend. Aaron's anxiety hasn't gone completely, but it doesn't dominate his life anymore, and he no longer hides it from those closest to him. As for James, six months on, he's returned to university in Exeter to redo the first year of his drama degree. So far, he's kept his OCD in check and is enjoying a life free of anxiety. It may seem a bit weird, um, but yeah, I just, um, yeah, I'll just do it anyway. Uh. Thank you!